that a question ends in a question mark. <laughs> Finally, please uh, keep your phones on silent. And here to formally introduce our speaker is Kevin Iracose. Kevin is a philosophy PhD student from Gatega, Burundi. He is a graduate student fellow here at the International House, where he also works as a graduate global impact intern. Please join me in welcoming Kevin to the podium. Good afternoon. It is a great honor for me to introduce today's speaker, His Excellency President Nana Adodankwa Ikufu Ado, President of, of the Republic of Ghana. President Ikufu Ado's political career spans more than 50 years, through which he has served in diverse capacities as Member of Parliament, as Cabinet Minister, as Attorney General and Minister of Justice, as, and as Foreign Minister. He was elected President of the Republic of Ghana in 2016. In the course of his public service, he has remained at the forefront of the fight to guarantee universal human rights, to build democracy, to increase freedom, and to uphold the rule of law. Today, he is known as one of the key leaders of the movement for democracy in Ghana and on the African continent. As Ghana's head of state, uh, President Ekufu Addo has also prioritized reforms of the economy and education. During his tenure, the national GDP has increased, and both inflation and interest rates have decreased. His Excellency has also extended free access to secondary school education to every Ghanaian student. As a child of Africa, I am deeply comforted by the constant concern President Ekufu Addo shows for the youth by increasing opportunities for education and creating jobs. He has often said that Africa and its leaders have a responsibility for its young people. His many accomplishments reflect a commitment to that responsibility, and his work remains a source of hope to young Africans like me. It helps us believe, as he likes to say, that we can do it. Today, President Ekufu Addo will make formal remarks, and then he will take questions from the audience, as we just heard. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming His Excellency, President Nana Ekufu Addo. Ghana's Minister for Foreign Affairs, our Ambassador to the United States, distinguished members of the faculty, students, ladies and gentlemen, I'm grateful for the invitation to be part of this forum organized by the University of Chicago's Institute of Politics, an event taking place at this prestigious American Ivy League institution. I thank the president of the university, Robert Zimmer, and the director of the institute, the famous David Axelrod, for the honor. I'm delighted to be in the home state of America's greatest president, Abraham Lincoln. And in, and in this iconic city, which has such a rich industrial, commercial, artistic, and musical history, and which has produced the first African-American president of the United States of America, the Ivy League educated 44th president and former senator, US senator of the state of Illinois, Barack Hussein Obama, who I understand does not live far from here. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, there's an old proverb, one which I particularly like, which says, Smooth seas do not make skillful sailors. As a few of you may know, my route to the high office of President of the Republic of Ghana was not a smooth one. By the generosity of the Ghanaian people, by the grace of God, I became president after winning the 2016 elections, 18 long years after I formally first declared my intention to lead my party the New Patriotic Party in 1998. 
My initial memories were what turned out to be a major political event in my country. As an almost four-year-old, I remember one morning when my father's house in downtown Accra, our capital, was suddenly transformed into a railway station at rush hour. Literally, hundreds and hundreds of people coming and going into the house in great excitement, looking for my relatives, my granduncle, my uncle, my father, and my mother. I had no idea then what it was all about, but I do remember my little mind making the decision that whatever my relatives were doing is what I would also do when I grew up. Because it was obvious that their work mattered a lot to people and that it was exciting. It turned out that that day was 28th February 1948, when ex-servicemen of the last war, the Second World War, of the Gold Coast, the name for colonial Ghana, went on a peaceful demonstration in Accra to present a petition to the colonial governor about their grievances, including the non-payment of their entitlements. In the course of the demonstration, British colonial police fired on the unarmed demonstrators and killed three of them. News of this outrage spread through the city and the country like the proverbial wildfire. A cry itself was nearly burnt to the ground and the air of freedom, which already was strongly abroad the country as a result of the inauguration six months earlier on 4th August 1947 of the first nationalist party of our history the United Gold Coast Convention, UGCC, which had stated as its ex express goal the attainment of independence for our country within the shortest possible time, turned feverish. The events of 28th February enhanced dramatically the demand for freedom echoing throughout the country. The date has become a sacred date in the nationalist calendar, the object of annual official commemoration. And the three murdered ex-servicemen have attained the status of martyrs in the nationalist cause. The area where the killings occurred, Christiansburg Crossroads, is now a national monument. Betty House, my father's house in downtown Accra, was effectively the headquarters of the UGCC, hence the commotion in the house on that day. The six most active leaders of the UGCC were arrested and detained by the colonial authorities and held responsible for the disturbances and riots. They have gone down in Ghanaian history as the legendary Big Six, who are to be found on our national currency. The celebrated Kwame Nkrumah, who was to be Ghana's first president, Emmanuel Obeche Bilamte and Ernest Akwaje were three of them. The other three, my granduncle, Dr. J.B. Denkwa, who was to become Kwame Nkrumah's greatest opponent. My uncle, William Oforeta, later to be eulogized as Pawali. And my father, Edward Okufuado, the future third Chief Justice of Ghana and ceremonial president of the Second Republic, 1969-1972, were the relatives people were seeking for in Betty House on that fateful day of 28th February. So as you can see, I had little choice or chance in deciding my destiny. <laughs> Growing up, it became evident that the freedom the early nationalists fought for was not only from colonialist and imperialist control, but also from internal oppression. Hence the courageous and principled stance taken by many of them in the First Republic when the nation was gripped by authoritarian rule. This was highlighted by the martyrdoms of Dr. Dankwa and Emmanuel Obeche Bilamte, two of the big six, who died in prison without trial, and the long periods of political detention without trial suffered by thousands of opposition activists under the Obnoxious Preventive Detention Act, which gave power to government to detain citizens without trial for five years at a time. To the peril of their lives, they were not ready to compromise their conviction 
that independent Ghana had to be built on democratic principles. The fight for democracy became the goal of my political career. I went to a state primary school in Accra, and at the age of 10, my father sent my sisters and I to prep school and secondary school in England after which I took a degree in economics at the University of Ghana. I went back to England to read for the bar at the famous Inns of Court and was called to the Middle Temple Bar in 1971. I then went on to work in France as a freshly qualified barrister with a then renowned international US law firm, Couder Frere, Couder Brothers, for a period of five years. I enjoyed very much my five year stay in Paris. It is difficult to resist, to resist the charms of argu arguably the most beautiful city in Europe for some in the world, especially when you're young and active. <laughs> Apart from a welcome exposure to French civilization and French politics, my stay enabled me to become fluent in French, a lifelong gift, to establish strong friendships with several Francophone West Africans another valuable contribution to my development, and to gain a deep insight into the workings of the multinational companies that dominate many aspects of the global economy. I returned home in 1975 to practice law, and by 1979, I had formed with a childhood friend who's now an important traditional ruler, the firm of Okufuado, Prempe & Co., which has proved to be one of the most successful law firms in Ghana. Apart from the standard fare of legal practice, corporate affairs, real property transactions, intellectual property matters, and civil suits, the firm also became renowned for its pro bono work and its engagement in constitutional and human rights litigation. Many of the most important constitutional cases of the modern era in Ghana were conducted by the firm. It proved provided for me a seamless entree into the world of politics. Democrats of my generation fought attempts in 1977 by the then military ruler, General I.K. Achampong, to, re to reintroduce a one-party state in Ghana. Some of us spent brief periods in police cells and had to go into temporary exile as a result of the threats on our lives. But we still persisted in our belief that a Ghana fully imbued with the tenets of respect for individual liberties and human rights, there is a rule of law and the principles of democratic accountability, was our surest bet towards accelerating development, improving the living conditions of our people, and putting Ghana onto the path of progress and prosperity. I'm proud to have been a part of Ghana's transformation into a fully democratic state. I'm humbled when people say that I had a role a leading role in those efforts. Throughout those years, from the time when we were seeking to restore multi-party democracy in Ghana and wrestle political power from the government of the National Democratic Congress, now the party of opposition, down to my taking my first shot at the presidency in 2008, I had the good fortune of meeting a wide range of people whose encounter enriched my political understanding. I met young people who were keen to work. I met young people who were desperate to start on the first ladder to their own businesses. And I met young people who were dying to start families of their own. Many of these young people had been to school. Many of them had done what society had asked of them. That is, they had the qualifications, but they remained unemployed. Many who did not have the benefit of schooling were also without jobs and were demoralized as they saw no prospects ahead. I also witnessed at first hand what years of failed governance had done to our nation. The unprecedented levels of joblessness, high cost of living, widespread and rampant cases of corruption, deterioration in governance and in the quality of our health and education services. I had seen the implementation of policies that hurt and collapsed businesses. And I saw business and consumer confidence plummet as the cost of doing business increased and consumers did not have the spending power to buy, buy what they want. Upon becoming president in January 2017, after two unsuccessful attempts in 2008 and 2012, 
I put before the Ghanaian people an ambitious program of socio and economic transformation hinged on restructuring the institutions of our governance, modernizing our agriculture to enhance its productivity, expanding rapidly our industrial sector, and rationalizing the financial sector to enable it to support growth in agriculture and growth in manufacturing and industry. It is my view that this is the best way to build a robust economy, create progress and prosperity for the Ghanaian people, and lead the country to a situation beyond aid. That is indeed our goal, a Ghana beyond aid, a Ghana capable of mobilizing her own material and human resources to build a strong economy which can generate prosperity for the mass of her people, a Ghana no longer dependent on handouts and charity. The first order of the day has been to get the fundamentals of the Ghanaian economy right. With some degree of success, we have ensured the growth of our economy and all the fundamentals of our macroeconomy are po pointing in the right direction. Indeed, the Ghanaian economy, whose growth rate stood at 3.6% in 2016, the lowest in two decades, grew by 8.5% in 2017, our first year in office, and by 6% last year. This year, at 7.9%, we are projected to be one of the fastest growing economies in Africa. Inflation is now in single digits, down from the 15.4% in 2016. We've reduced the fiscal deficit from 9.3% in 2016 to 3.7%. And our trade balance account, for the first time in more than a decade, recorded a surplus in 2017 and is expected to remain in surplus. My government has also embarked on building a workforce that is equipped and skilled and can compete effectively on the global market to propel our swift industrial development. The countries that have made rapid progress around the world put education at the heart of their development. Ghana, under my leadership, is following suit. We're making sure that every Ghanaian child, through our free high high school uh, senior high school policy has access to a minimum of secondary school education. Already, the free SHS policy, introduced for the first time by my government in, 17, in September 2017, has resulted in 270,000 more students gaining access to senior high school in 2017 and 2018 than in 2016. We're bringing legislation to redefine basic education as education from kindergarten up to the end of senior high school and to make it compulsory for all of Ghana's children. The process of reviving Ghanaian agriculture is ongoing with a program we have dubbed Planting for Food and Jobs. Beginning with 200,000 farmers in 2017, scaling up to 500,000 in 2018, and a projected one million farmers this year. We're providing them with improved seeds, subsidized fertilizers, and extension offices who have been previously non-existent. Through the program, we've managed to engineer a revival of Ghanaian agriculture from a growth of 2.9% in 2016 to 8.4% in 2017, 6.8% in 2018, and a projected 7.3% in 2019. And we have also increased significantly the production of staples. There's been food, and for the first time in a long while, we had more than we needed. Again, for the first time in a long while, exports of food crops from, were made from Ghana to our neighbors in Burkina Faso, Togo, and Cote d'Ivoire in considerable quantities. As a relatively new entrant in the League of All Producing Countries, we have two options about what to do with the oil. One, to treat it like we have done with gold and allow it to be exported in its raw material form as crude. Or two, use it as an appropriate vehicle to transform the structure of our economy through industrial and value-added commercial activities. 
We're determined to use our all revenues to create assets, not waste it on consumption and accumulate debt simply because people will lend us money now that we have oil. We're also very desirous of developing strategic industries out of our abundant natural resources of bauxite and iron ore. We have established by statute a public commercial corporation, the Ghana Integrated Bauxite Development Corporation, to assemble the relevant financial resources for the full exploitation and development of the entire value chain in Ghana of our large bauxite deposits. Aluminum, as we know, is the metal of the future, and we intend to be an important producer. By the same token, we have decided to exploit our substantial iron ore and manganese develop deposits situated in the western and northern regions of our country to build an integrated steel industry to serve the needs of our country and, re and region. We shall be establishing shortly a Ghana Iron and Steel Development Corporation to spearhead this development. We have also instituted a policy of one district, one factory to engineer the process of rural industrialization, creating jobs in the countryside and halting the rural urban drift of our youth, which is one of the greatest threats to the coherence and stability of our nation. Our overarching goal to diversify our economy and the modest successes chalked in reviving the Ghanaian economy and creating a business-friendly environment have received major boosts the announcement made by global car giants such as Volkswagen of Germany, Sinotrack of China, Nissan and Suzuki of Japan, of their dis established decision to establish very soon assembly plants in Ghana with the intention in the medium term of producing their vehicles in the country. Tech giant Google has also decided to base its Art African Artificial Intelligence Center in Ghana, the first the first in Africa. <laughs> U.S. global energy giant ExxonMobil and the big Norwegian oil and gas company Aka Energy have both signed agreements with the Ghana National Petroleum Corporation, GNPC, to undertake deep water oil and gas exploration and production. Our projection is that from the new discoveries, our production of crude oil will rise from the current amount of 200,000 barrels per day to 500,000 barrels per day by 2024. We are also at the same time not forgetting about the development of our renewable energy and have committed ourselves to make solar energy 10% of our energy generation mix by 2020 from the current level of 1%. Today. Today, Ghana is the leading recipient of foreign direct investment in West Africa. To foster our development, we will look west, east, north, and south with our prejudice. But there should be no surprise if we are more welcoming to those who are prepared to invest in our priority areas. There are increasingly loud anxieties being expressed about the close relations developing between China and Africa, including our own country of Ghana. And some have allegedly seen in it a real danger of a new colonization of the African continent, this time by China. It is fair to say that we are all much wiser about these things. And we're going to go into these new relations with our eyes wide open. Nobody is coming pretending to, bring in, to be bringing God's word in one hand and taking our lands and resources with the other. This time around, we will look after our interests in much the same way as we know all other nations that we deal with look after their own interests. We are not the only ones dealing with China, the world's second biggest economy. Everyone is dealing with China, and we're doing so with our eyes wide open. Ghana appreciates the continuing assistance offered to our country and to the financing of our budgets 
by the American people and their government. Thus, towards the holding of the 2016 elections, the election which brought me to office, the United States contributed some $7 million towards the holding of that election, received $547 million from Millennium Challenge Compact I, negotiated by the Kufour government with the then Bush government when I was governor, Ghana's foreign minister. It was satisfactorily performed, which enabled us to enter into Millennium Challenge Account Compact II, negotiated by the successor Mills Obama governments, providing nearly 500 million United States dollars being invested in Ghana to improve power generation. Nonetheless, the time has come for a new form of relationship between Ghana and the United States of America. We're not disclaiming aid, but we do want to discard a mindset of dependency. It is unhealthy, both for the giver and for the receiver. We want our relations with the United States to be characterized by a substantial increase in trade and investment cooperation. This is the way to develop healthy relations between our two countries and thereby strengthen our economies and raise the living standards of our two peoples. I will continue to urge the current leadership of this great nation, proclaimed as the land of the free and the, and the home of the brave, not to ignore Africa. The Trump administration's better utilization of investments leading to development, BUILD Act, which has created the US International Development Finance Corporation with a 60 billion budget for equity investments on the continent is a very creative and positive initiative. It could have a major impact on US involvement in Africa's growth, especially if the access to the funds is not impeded by excessive bureaucratic procedure. Many people say that this is the Asian century, but I believe strongly that this can be Africa's century. We are rich in natural resources and in possession of 30% of the Earth's remaining minerals. We have a vibrant young population, and although we still have important security challenges, we are more at peace than ever before. That is why I'm excited by the decision taken by the African Union to establish an African continental free trade area. Signed by 52 member countries and already ratified by some 21, with Ghana the first to deposit her instrument of ratification at the AU Commission headquarters in Addis Ababa, the AFCFTA whose agreement, when ratified by the 22nd member state, will come into effect and will eventually link all the 54 markets covering 1.2 billion people with a combined GDP of 2.5 trillion United States dollars into a single market. It will be the world's largest free trade area outside of the World Trade Organization itself. By 2050, it will cover an estimated 2.5 billion people and have a quarter over a quarter of the world's working age population within its ambit. Imagine the investment and business opportunities offered by the infrastructure required to link these markets more effectively and the opportunities such a market can generate. It can be a solid basis for the creation of wealth and prosperity for the long-suffering African people. The future, it may be said, is indeed Africa. Before I conclude, it is important to state that in September 2018, in Washington, D.C., in front of the Congressional Black Caucus of the United States Congress, I proclaimed 2019 as the year of return, commemorating the 400th, the 400th anniversary of the time when the first 20 West African slaves were brought to the Commonwealth of Virginia, which subsequently became part of the United States of America, thereby commencing one of the most unfortunate and barbaric episodes of human history, the transatlantic slave trade. The commemoration is a statement of our determination that never again should the African peoples permit themselves to be subjected to such dehumanizing conditions.
sold into slavery and have their freedoms curtailed in order to build up forcibly countries other than their own and create wealth for the peoples of unknown lands to which they were sent, wealth from whose enjoyment they were largely excluded. We intend to use the symbolism of this year of return to bring together Africans, persons of African descent, and all well-wishers and lovers of freedom to strengthen the commitment to ensuring that blots on human history, such as the transatlantic slave trade and slavery, never reoccur. We also want to use the events of this year to solidify our relations with our kith and kin, descendants of Africa here in the Americas and the Caribbean. It should be obvious to all black people in the world by now that their dignity and standing are intricately bound up with the dignity and standing of Africa. And I'm inviting you to pay a visit to Ghana in the course of the commemoration of this landmark event. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm working towards building a Ghana where people have jobs and decent livelihoods. Ghana is endowed with great potential where security and the rule of law are upheld, where investments are secure. We want to contribute to the global market at the higher end of the value chain for Ghanaian products. We want to bring greater dignity to the lives of millions of people in Ghana. We want to build a Ghana beyond aid, which has discarded a mindset of dependence, aid, charity, and handouts. And we mean business. I thank you for your attention. And may God bless us all and the peoples of the United States and Ghana. Institute of Politics, our mission is to inspire students and young people to consider lives of public service and to serve their countries. And there is no better example of, of how you can do that in a story of how to make a difference than what we've just heard. His Excellency has graciously uh, agreed to take some questions. We would be honored to have the first few questions from students, if there are any. Um, I have some if, if, if our students don't get up. Come on, guys, don't be shy. <laughs> a very um, inspiring story, very exciting progress that you're making already, and a very clear vision for where to take your country. Thank you. Do we have a first question from a student? Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. My name is Mariana Kumu. I'm a graduate student at the Harris School of Public Policy. <coughs> um, you did not say um, too much about uh, the accountability issues on the African continent. But my question is, if Omar el-Bashir of Sudan were to visit Ghana, would he be arrested in compliance with the ICC uh, arrest warrant against him? And briefly, your thoughts on the ICC as an accountability mechanism, especially uh, pertaining to leaders still in power. Thank you. Why don't we take the first question and then we'll come to the second one. Okay. Yes, it's a, it's a constant problem we're having. We've taken the view, and we had this when Charles Taylor, the uh, former president of Liberia, came to Ghana at a time when the tribunal trying him issued a warrant for his address. We took the view that Taylor had come to our country as a, a fellow head of state, covered by all the diplomatic matters, and that therefore we will not assist the, the court to arrest him on Ghanaian soil. Our position has not changed. That's, that, that, that's the reality of it. We are strong supporters of the ICC, but we believe that in these, uh, in these matters, um, they have to engage themselves in finding uh, more appropriate uh, avenues for bringing people to justice, if you like. But Bashir would, well, first of all, he hasn't come to Ghana. 
Uh, but he would definitely not be handed over to them if he was to come to Ghana, so long as he remains president of Sudan. Hi, my name is SMA Sekbethia, and I wanted to ask about the Ghana-China deal. And many people are wondering in Ghana if Ga the Ghanians themselves will receive those benefits that the deal is trying to create. And you've stated that we are going into the deal with eyes wide open. However, I want to know what specifically does that phrase mean? How, what steps will Ghana take to make sure that the Ghanians themselves receive the benefits of those deals? The Sino-Hydro Corporation deal with our country involves Sino-Hydro advancing $2 billion to the government of Ghana to help it finance its infrastructural developments. So underneath the program, we have a very extensive road and railway development program that has been, in fact, when I return home to Ghana on the 10th of April, I'll be cutting the sword for the commencement of one of the important infrastructural projects that are taking place in the north. We're going to have significant amount of money available to deal with one of the most important deficits of our country. The rail and road infrastructure of Ghana are not what would enable us to build a modern economy. We don't have, many parts of our country are not properly connected. What connections there are in a poor state. We have a railway infrastructure that we inherited from Brit the British colonial uh, era, which we've allowed to go into disuse. And as everybody knows, is the most efficient way of transportation of goods and cargoes in any country. We want to revive and build our railway infrastructure. Unfortunately, we don't have the money at home to be able to do that. And this is what has enabled us uh, uh, to come into this arrangement. What will it mean in the end? We have got a mo uh, we have to pay back the money with aluminum products. Originally, the Chinese wanted us to pay them back with our bauxite deposits. This was what was on the table when I came into office. And I said, no, we can't do that again. We've seen that before in our history. It has not helped us. So what we will do is insist that we will send them aluminum products, i.e., we will develop in Ghana the whole range of refining, smeltering, and then producing aluminum in Ghana and exporting that to China. So what will the end result of the Sino-Hydro deal will be twofold would have had a much, much more improved infrastructure. And you know from here and from around the world that the, the quality of your infrastructure is the key determinant in your ability to grow your economy. We would have also have had a, a very significant industrial uh, facility, which, is our, which will be our bauxite development authority, control of refining, smelting, and producing alumina, it's aluminum. So that's the obvious and clearest example. And then the Ghanaian contractors that are going to be primarily responsible for the development and the ex of our infrastructure will also, of course, be in, uh, empowered be, by having access to these monies and developing their own uh, capability. So as far as I'm concerned, it's a good deal for Ghana. Uh, it's it's a, a deal that allows us to deal with critical deficits in our economic architecture and do, does so on terms that are not onerous to us. An economy that today doesn't have a good and railway network system, but which in three or four years will have one, will have an important industrial facility like a bauxite development authority. I believe as an economy that will be a much stronger and a much more uh, creative economy than the economy that we have now. So that is my answer to you. I think that if we do it, and we do it successfully, we will have empowered our economy, 
would have taken it onto a much stronger level, and all of us will benefit from that. Thank you very much, Mr. President. And uh, my name is Colin Stadzi. I come from Ghana and a graduate student at the Harris School of Public Policy. It's very exciting to have you here. Um, thank you for walking us through those great initiatives being um, led by your administration. I want to find out to what extent will these initiatives be implemented or stopped if your party does not win election in the next elections? We don't want to contemplate that. <laughs> <laughs> But in any event, in any event, really, if these are ongoing activities, and we're starting, in, we're starting now, effectively, we spent the last 18 months negotiating the commas and the dots and crossing the T's and uh, dotting the I's of the agreement, and now we're ready to start. Uh, there's another at least 18 months before we have to go to the polls and, 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 and uh, account for our activities. I'm assuming that by that time, this whole program will be very, very, very much uh, launched on its way. And I'd be surprised if uh, a successor government was to come and say that uh, th this is something that uh, th they don't want for our people because I think it's so essential. But in any event, as I said, uh, the, the, the possibilities of our losing 2020 are relatively remote, as things stand now. <laughs> Good afternoon, Mr. President. My name is Edward Hightower, and I am an engineering and business executive in the global automotive industry. I've worked in China, South Korea, Mexico, Brazil, and I'm also the author of Motoring Africa, a book about how to develop the automotive industry in six of the 54 countries on the African continent. Uh, my question is, uh, how are the announcements that you've made about the assembly plants uh, progressing? And the second part of my question is, may I have the honor of presenting you with a copy of my book? <laughs> Let me first of all respond to the second one. Very grateful uh, for, for, the, for the, it's an honor. Thank you, I'll, I'll take. Uh, the first part, I, any time from now, I'm, ex I'm anticipating <coughs> it'll be in this week, the automotive policy of the government will be finally outdoored. It has gone through all the processes of agreement that it needs to the approvals within the government system. And I believe that the Minister of Trade and Industry is getting ready any second now to announce the policy. But I think that the policy has to come before final decisions are taken by people. You must be fully aware of that. But, that is, but these are the people who have already began talking with us and taking significant steps like identifying land where they like to set up their plants. All that is going on and the local arrangements that they want to make with their partners. All that is fairly fair advanced. But I, the final decision will be taken when the automobile policy, to which they've already been exposed, even though on the informals, is formally outdoored and is then made official government policy so that people will know where to go from there. That's it. Hello, good afternoon, Mr. President. Akwaba. Thank it's you. wonderful to have you here. I'm Samia Amu, JT Amu's uh, older daughter. Samia. And uh, again, welcome. Um, my question is, Mr. President, for, <coughs> for Ghanaian Americans who are living here, uh, what suggestions would you have that we do in response to the recent uh, measures that the State Department has taken against restricting uh, Ghanaians who wish to visit the United States and restricting some of the visas? Any suggestions for us who live here? Well, um, the matter is still, is still very much alive. As we are speaking now, tomorrow, the foreign minister who's here with us and our ambassador will be with both the State Department and the Homeland Security to continue to, dis to debate the issues. We think that the, the American administration got the wrong end of the stick and we have spent the last couple of months trying to explain to them exactly what the realities are. So I'm hoping that tomorrow 
the meeting that the two of them will have with both the State Department and the Department of Homeland Security will bring better news for us. But we will cross our fingers and wait to see. But of course, the more, I, we, this is a democracy, and the more noise you make, the better it is also that uh, hopefully we'll get something out of it. If we keep questions brief, we can fit two or three more in. All right, thank you, Mr. President, for coming. My name is Elizabeth Gemma. And uh, you know, thank you so much for everything you've said about what you're doing in the country and the policies that you're implementing. Uh, I do have a question. Uh, when you were campaigning, you talked about doom soar or the power outages. And uh, you know, for the last few years, there's been none of that stuff. But uh, do you see a comeback of these power outages or the doom soar as it's known over in Ghana? And how is this going to affect the policies like the power plants, aluminum, and all that kind of stuff that you're trying to do in the future? That's an important question. Um, one of the things that we have been able to do is to ensure the regularity and the security of supply. Uh, we believe that now the, dis the disconnect and the disequilibrium in the system which gave rise to doom so has been taken care of. Generation in Ghana now is back to normal. We anticipate that the fact that we have excess capacity which we're bringing into play. We're now exporting power again to Burkina Faso. We're about to start exporting power to Togo as well. So the generating side of it has been well taken care of. And then the distribution, which has been a problem, is also being reformed and improved. We have a lot of gas in Ghana, and we are restructuring uh, the facilities that produced now to become gas-fired as against the fuel-fired. All these uh, initiatives that are on course in the course of the next year, I believe by the end of that period, when uh, this re restructuring of the energy sector in Ghana has been completed, we'll be in a very, very strong position going forward and ensuring that there will be that uh, low-cost, regular supply of energy that um, we would require to fire our bauxite and uh, iron ore uh, industries and generally industries in Ghana altogether. I'm optimistic that we will not go back to the days of doing so. Good afternoon, Mr. President. My name is Albert Ekwamwa. Hey, my question, uh, concerns the West African Monetary Zone and the proposed uh, single currency for the ECOWAS countries. And that is, in which way, first, what is the status of the single currency and in what way do you see the single ECOWAS currency benefiting Ghanaians in a way that the CD could not? First of all, the status. Some three years ago, four countries within ECOWAS were charged with the responsibility of driving the process towards the single currency. It's called the ECO. That is Niger, Ghana, Cote d'Ivoire, and Nigeria. And you see in that mix already that the two, the three most important economies of West Africa, Nigeria, Ghana, and Cote d'Ivoire, are part of the of the, the three of the quartet. Senegal is the fourth biggest economy, but it has not been part of this exercise. The discussions have got to the point where now we must make some fundamental decisions. The most fundamental, apart from the alignment and the conversion criteria and everything, is the fate of the CFA. The CFA, which is the country that is in, uh, which is the currency that is in use in the Uwema countries, that is the Francophone, the former French colonies, as it were, is tied to the, the, to the French franc and to the euro, not the French franc, to the euro. And ultimately, it means that the influence of the Banque de France on the currency is very strong. 
clearly that is going to be a difficult situation for countries like my own and for Nigeria, who have a greater independence in the management of our own currencies. So that is a, just one of the key decisions that is going to have to be taken by the Uwema countries. Their view is that once the, the various criteria for convergence have been met, at least two or three of the basic ones have been met, it will give them the strength to leave the CFR and come into the new currency. But it's, that is a very, a very, very key decision that has to be made before we can get to the echo. How will it benefit us? I think that the benefits of it are, are, are obvious. We would have, if it, was, if it was to come about one currency that will trade in a, a community of 350 million people, the facilitation that it will do of trade between us. We are the second biggest economy of, these, of this 350 million market, very well placed um, geographically within the community. And if our enterprises and business people have the dynamism and the sense of enterprise that I believe that they have, it, the, this market will provide tremendous opportunities for Ghanaian enterprise and for Ghanaian business, and that we would be, we would be we would be in a stronger position within the ECHO and the community than we are today with our own currency, which is restricted has a restricted uh, area of operation of 30 million people. Is all the difference between having a currency that you can use to finance activities for a market of 350 million people and for a market of 30 million people. Do we have a quick last question? Good afternoon, Mr. President. My name is Debbie Adewale, and I was just wondering, given the recent discovery of crude oil in Ghana, what does your administration plan to do with it? Will you allow the oil to be sold first while crude, or will you build a refinery and then sell it? And following that up, how will you manage the revenue that comes from this oil better than other West African countries like Nigeria? Well, as I think I tried to indicate in, 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 in my speech, that we are definitely not taking the well, what on the face of it may seem like the easiest option is the sale of the, of, of the, of the oil as crude oil. That that is not the path we want to go to. We want, on the basis of the, the discoveries, to set up a whole value chain of activities around it. We don't have any petrochemical industries in Ghana. We don't produce fertilizer. We don't produce ethanol. We don't produce urea. We don't... Uh, Generally, uh, we're left in a situation where the, the, the oil goes without value. I think that this time round, that's going to be our emphasis. And uh, the arrangements we are making with the companies that are now going to produce the oil, these developments and initiatives have been factored into it. So that's it. In terms of the use of the monies, I'm not quite sure I understand the comparison with Nigeria, and I would like to uh, just concentrate on that. Uh, I, I don't think that I need to speak about Nigeria, which is that we already have uh, rigorous institutional control over the expenditure of our, our, our revenues. As we speak now, there are elaborate provisions in the law, in the work of our parliament, in the institutions that have been set up to make sure that the oil revenue is properly utilized and that doesn't end up in the pockets of people like myself, that rather it is used for the, 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 the progress and the welfare of our country. I'm very confident that the institutional arrangements that there are in Ghana will be respected and in, when they are respected, they will also ensure maximum accountability for the use of the revenues. It's important that it should be, it should be so. I'm going to take sponsor's prerogative for one quick last question. Um, we, we are having a, a number of young people that we work with who are going to be voting in their own election for the first time in the next presidential election here. Um, from your years in leadership and, uh, and citizen engagement, what advice do you have to our students? 
about what they should be looking for in uh, making their vote in terms of a leader to choose? Well, I think that, I mean, in, like in, in every election, it's, it's not about today, it's about tomorrow. The election is always about tomorrow. And who appears to have a, a credible program for making tomorrow better? And who exudes a certain amount of integrity and uh, responsibility for that program? I think everybody is required to sit down and make that calculation for themselves before they go and then put their ballot in, 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 in the box. Who has a program that makes sense for you? You look at the future of America. Who, from the way they talk, their body language, everything, has the credibility, the integrity to make that program real? To me, those are the two critical things that they should look out for and hopefully enable them to make a decent choice. We, we wish you uh, all good luck with your program for tomorrow and for productive and fruitful engagement with the United States. Thank you so much. Excellency, uh, thank you very much uh, for sharing your action. <laughs> can you hear us? President yes, Akufo can, can, can you hear us? Me. Could you share your action yes, with I us? Yes, I can please? hear you. Can you hear me? I can hear you very well. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Yes. All right. Okay. Please share your actions with us, if you can. All right. Okay. Your Excellencies, as co chair of the United Nations Eminent Group of Advocates, for the Sustainable Development Goals. I'm delighted to join you this afternoon virtually for this historic Climate Adaptation Summit. I thank my good friend, the former Secretary General of the United Nations, His Excellency, Mr. Ban Ki-moon, for the honor of this invitation. The climate crisis is wrecking lives and livelihoods and disproportionately affecting the poor and the most vulnerable in society. Amid the existential threat posed by climate change, this summit comes at a time when our world is faced with one of its toughest challenges yet, the COVID-19 pandemic. It is a challenge we must not only confront head on, but one from which we must emerge as victors. It is vital that we are united in action and do all we can as soon as possible to save lives, restore livelihoods, and spur the growth of our economies. While ensuring this, it is incumbent on all of us to help protect our communities from future health, economic, and climate change shocks. In Ghana, we're committed to promoting climate adaptation action. And that is why we're pleased to be collaborating with the Global Center on Adaptation in close collaboration with the African Development Bank in pioneering solutions on how to build durable infrastructure and supporting African cities to guard against the impacts of climate change. We're also working with the private sector and with the assistance of the Green Climate Fund to establish a multi-million dollar green fund to support our climate adaptation interventions and our efforts to transition to renewable energy. We expect these initiatives to deliver tangible progress towards Ghana's adaptation and development objectives. By laying the foundation now, we bestow to future generations stronger, safer, and healthier communities. Young people have done the least to cause climate change and yet will suffer its impact the most. Across Africa, the continent with the world's youngest population, we must scale up the solutions that deliver green jobs and resilient livelihoods. It is for them and future generations that we must all come together and use this summit as a turning point to create a more prosperous, greener, and fairer world. We cannot fail in this endeavor as success 
is the greatest inheritance that we can leave for the current and future generations. I thank your excellences for your attention. Thank you.